praise Alam and the team at CIIC for giving me this opportunity. Uh, during this lockdown, it is difficult for us to keep engaged in our professions. These webinars, I think, will certainly be of use so that we can have new ideas when the lockdown is over. So my title actually should be slightly different. Uh, it says strategies for low budget research, which is what I got printed on the profile, which I sent uh, Parvez. But actually low budget is often linked with low quality. So let me make that change now and say that I want to talk about strategies for low budget and high quality research. That is the desire that we have. So let me go to the first slide where I want to give an outline of what I will say. Uh, three main strategies will be discussed. The first is repurposing of data. The second is repurposing of existing tech. And the third is repurposing your brain. If these sound confusing, don't worry. I'll be going into each strategy in details. Uh, these three strategies will only work if you ask new questions and get new perspectives. Now, how do you get that? It doesn't come overnight. You have to become very knowledgeable in your chosen subject, whatever it is, electronics, architecture, um, legal work, whatever. Become an expert in that field. Find the gaps in the knowledge. Some areas may be talked about a lot. Some areas may have very little information. So find those gaps. Also find the obstacles. Which are the obstacles in your field which others are also getting affected by? And that is why the subject has stopped advancing. So if you know your subject very well, you will be able to find these gaps and obstacles. And that is where your new questions come. And once you have those new questions, you can have your strategies work very well for you. So this has happened in my experience. I'll give you examples of it so that it makes sense to you. So what is this repurposing that I'm talking about? I think the best example you may already know, because we've all been hearing about chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, which is a very successful drug for malaria prevention. For more than 50, 60 years, it's worked. And people realized, why don't we repurpose this? That means reuse the chloroquine for some other disease. And indeed, it works quite well for lupus and for rheumatoid arthritis. And now there is a big debate and controversy about will chloroquine be repurposed for COVID-19. I'll come back to that debate, but please understand what the word repurposing means. It means taking something that is used for one application and using it for a second or a third application. That's all. So if we can repurpose a drug, why we repurpose data, right? So this is the first strategy, low risk strategy. It's inexpensive because the data is already there. It exists. It's also not a risky strategy because you have become an expert in your field. You know this data, but you have to learn new things. You've got to put in a sustained effort. So how does this strategy actually work? So my example is what will come next. I first want to give the outline. You should identify a very well known documented database which has free data sets. A lot of them are available online. You should learn how to analyze these data with software or some simple software you can learn. Now remember, there may already be publications and patents from this free data set you've chosen. So you have to read carefully, find new questions that these publications did not address. And then using your knowledge of the subject, you found the gaps, you found the obstacles, 
reanalyze the data set with your own approach, your own hypothesis, your own questions, and definitely you will see some good results. So what was my experience with this? I'm not going to tell you a strategy that hasn't worked for me, right? So at uh, MGR University about six years ago, uh, we wanted to learn microarray analysis. We found this free data set on gene expression, compared expression of genes in the normal skin compared to a cancer skin. This was melanoma cancer. And all the literature on melanoma was focused on gene markers for diagnosis, treatment, etc. We took a different view. We said skin maintains a waterproof barrier for the whole body. Why? Because it contains a lot of fat. And without this waterproof barrier, we won't survive. We also knew that cancers have some abnormalities in their fat metabolism. So we reanalyzed this data set for genes regulating fat metabolism. And we were very excited to get the results which showed that specific fat metabolism genes and pathways were significantly activated in the melanoma skin compared to the normal skin. And can you believe this was the first such report on melanoma worldwide? Worldwide. And we could publish it in a small Indian journal, but we have been getting good citations. So we were not geniuses. I knew very little about melanoma. But what I realized was that melanoma was only talking about diagnosis and treatment. Nobody was talking about the fat in the skin and how it is getting altered during melanoma. So I took a different angle, looked at a gap in the knowledge and reanalyzed the same data set. So this shows you that data repurposing can really work. Now, is there free data out there that you may like to analyze? Yes. So I searched and this is one good database from the WHO. It's called EMDAT and it has a databases, sorry, data sets on thousands of mass disasters all over the world. The data is compiled from very reputable agencies. So can you reanalyze this data and identify the best policies for crisis management? You know, we are having a public health emergency now. So maybe reanalyzing this type of data will also help us face public health problems and climate change problems. So this challenge is there for you. Uh, many of you youngsters may want to check out this data set. The next one I found was at NASA. They have a prognostics data repository. Again, a lot of free data sets on how to develop certain types of algorithms. Now, I am a complete zero on algorithms, but the idea is that this data is there. It's again come from good agencies and universities which work with NASA. It's a free data. Perhaps you can consider reanalyzing it and finding something new. And the last example is free data on industrial metals and other substances. So matdat.com has again lots of referenced and verified data sets for different types of metals. And some of you in the industry sector may want to take a look at this. So the main point is there is plenty of online data. You have to be sure it is a well curated database, good quality data. You have to make sure that that data, what publications and patents came out of it, you should be thorough with that. Then you go in with your question, reanalyze, and boom, you should get a good result. So this is the end of uh, strategy one. I want to now move on to my second strategy, repurposing of tech. We've talked about repurposing data, how about repurposing tech? In fact, uh, many of you at CIIC, I'm happy to say, are already doing this, right? 
the company was making X, and now you're making products for COVID related problems, ventilators, sanitizers, special masks, gowns, etc. So the strategy may be costly and risky because other people may also be trying to do this, but at least you have the infrastructure costs at a minimum because you already have the technology. You're just applying the technology to make a new product. So this is my second low risk strategy. Now, I was not making a product. I was doing research in Pune, specifically in 2005. And we had a grant on Ayurvedic herbs and using cells to analyze some of the effects. So this slide shows you two Ayurvedic herbs. On the left, you see the Amla or the Nelikai fruit, brown color. On the right, you see ashwagandha and in ashwagandha the root is considered to have very strong properties so fine everybody loves amla and ashwagandha but they are highly similar both animal studies and in humans show very strong and similar beneficial properties so we ask the question how can we distinguish between amla and ashwagandha at the cell level is it possible could we try this we found that not much is there in the literature about this. So we had a lab, we could measure cell growth, cell death. That was existing technology for us, very standard. So we took two methods for measuring cell growth. Both the methods, we had all the equipment, chemicals, no extra cost. One method is a short-term cell survival method, very popular, called the MTT assay. So you will add your amla ashwagandha to those cells and measure the percentage of cells surviving after three days. The second assay is also quite simple, but it's rarely used, maybe because it takes a long time. You have to let individual cells multiply and form a visible colony. And that usually takes two to three weeks. But we decided to use both these both assays and you'll see in a minute that it was extremely good decision. Why? Because the first MTT assay, we found that both these Ayurvedic herbs gave the same effect, couldn't make any difference between them. But in this colony forming assay, we found a difference. So I'm going to actually show you the data. So what you see here are two tissue culture plates. Each plate is sterile. It has cells growing in these cup-like structures. They are called wells. So in 1A, you see six such wells. In 1B, also, you see six wells. Now look under zero. Under zero, you see three wells with a lot of black dots. What is that? Each black dot is a colony of cells. Zero means no amla was added. 100 means 100 micrograms per ml of Amla fruit extract was added. 50 means 50 micrograms per ml fruit extract. But whatever we added, we got colonies. So we got the idea that Amla was not significantly affecting the colony forming ability of these cells. Now feelings are not enough. You have to count individual colonies and then you have to do the statistical calculations and prove that the number of colonies is not significantly different between 0 and 50, between 0 and 100. You have to repeat the experiment seven, eight times. So all this was done. And we were pakka and sure that AMLA did not affect the colony formation. There was a completely different story. Of course, we didn't know what to expect, but we were surprised. So again, you can see three tissue culture plates, 2A, 2B, and 2C. In each case, the zero means we've not added any ashwagandha. The colonies are allowed to form. Good many black dots are visible. But wherever we have added amla, uh, I'm sorry, ashwagandha, at different doses, 25, 50, 100, we see a loss in colony number. 
and we could again count and prove this that statistically there was a significant inhibition of colony formation by ashwagandha so what is the moral that we are very glad we used two assays for growth because both the ayurvedic herbs were equally active in the mtt assay and completely different in the colony formation assay so again our publication from pune is one of the few reports showing that these two herbs can have different effects now again we didn't we were not geniuses we didn't do anything great we just looked at the literature on our on ashwagandha looked at our technology in the lab and we took the trouble to do something more than mtt assay which is what everybody was doing and that is why we got some success so if we can do it surely all of you can do it right moving on the third strategy repurposing your brain i think most of you are doing this you know we call it skill development or online courses webinars uh, taking some particular topic and becoming an expert in it please do that because if you develop your brain power then other researchers will want to collaborate with you and that itself will enhance your quality of research it's a great low risk strategy you network with somebody and only because of your brain power how do you improve your brain power a suggestion i have is please learn statistics i feel bad that as a student i didn't do well and pursue statistics it is definitely something that will benefit all of you why one technique in statistics is called meta analysis very very useful it's a technique that you can use for handling studies with variable inputs or handling studies where the data has good quality bad quality different sample sizes and with this technique you should be able to analyze a group of related studies and get good data with statistical significance now let me give you an example remember we talked about that drug chloroquine right in the beginning how we said it might be repurposed for covid-19 so this is the problem there are all over the world some 20 different clinical studies on chloroquine some have admitted patients who are very serious some are mild some have diabetes some don't some are taking chloroquine some are taking chloroquine plus something else so you can see how many variable inputs are there they are all covid-19 patients but how do you handle this type of data set too much of variability in some studies only 15 people were enrolled in some chinese studies 2000 patients were enrolled so if you learn to do meta analysis and people have done this they looked at all these 20 studies good bad whatever and they said that we cannot make any statistically significant conclusion on chloroquine we can't say it is efficacious it has efficacy we can't say it is not effective so that meta analysis was very useful because it told the world even the who everybody said these 20 studies alone they have done meta analysis we can't make any clear conclusion without meta analysis you can't do this type of study so i hope i've pushed some of you to uh, go towards this technique very useful technique and by the way now because this meta analysis was done and chloroquine is so confusing again all over the world hundreds of clinical studies are going on with better quality and hopefully when we do that meta analysis we will learn something more about chloroquine right now it's a maybe maybe it has effect in some patients maybe it is bad for some patients maybe it is useless for a third set of patients so please give some importance to statistics uh i think another way to repurpose your brain is to look at problems 
that won't go away. And we certainly have a long list of them. So this is my list. Some of you may want to add to this list. But if you become an expert on these problems, you can start doing research on these, find free data sets, for example, on disaster management, climate change, etc., algorithms. So I hope this is something that you will be able to think about and enhance your research. I now want to uh, end this part of the talk and tell you that these three strategies have worked for me. I think they can work for you. You can get high quality results and you can avoid this problem of copycat research. What is this copycat research? So about a year ago, there was an article in the Hindu paper where a vice chancellor from a Kerala university said that university faculty are urged to discourage irrelevant research. And many state universities, the research topics are often repeated. Now, sadly, this is true. Why? There are so many ideas and unsolved problems. Why are we having to repeat research topics? Why are we doing irrelevant research? So this problem is there, right? People are not thinking of new topics and ideas and making original contributions. So I go back to this slide. Please think about these three strategies because I think they can help you avoid this problem of copycat research. I've also sometimes fallen in the trap of copycat research. You see somebody has done something, oh, I will also try that. I'll use different cells, I'll use a different drug. But that is not going to add much to the scientific knowledge. Okay, so please think of these things. I now want to move to this world where we have this new terms for me, sharing economy, gig economy, etc. And I want to bring up these topics and try to relate them to some of the startups that uh, CIIC is helping. So let's first define some terms. Sharing economy is where we share underused assets, basically repurposing equipment. Unused 3D printers, can they be repurposed? Or something else, unused PCR machines. So these are just examples. Uh, the gig economy is what I'm going to focus on because that is different from the sharing economy. Here we have online platforms where groups of freelance workers can work on a same common topic or a project. And in India, there are a lot of articles saying that this gig economy is booming. So in the services sector, it's about 25% of the urban workforce. And ASOCAM says it's going to be worth $500 million in the next few years. So our government has taken note and they want to offer some minimum social security package to these gig economy workers. And I think the benefits look pretty good. Pension, provident fund, health insurance, etc. And the delivery and mobility startups that we all know will surely benefit if these uh, social security systems actually happen. And uh, with that, I want to get now to my interest in the economy. I'm not a business person. I'm an academic. My question is, why this gig economy is only for mobility and delivery startups? I mean, this is fine, but what about research? Can we apply gig economy to R&D? The answer is yes. There is a company called Innocentive. It's been around for 20 years. It works in the gig economy mode. It uses freelance experts and researchers to solve the R&D problems for industry. So the next 10 slides or so, I'm going to talk about this, not because I'm working for Innocentive or I have some 
uh, alliance with them, not at all. But I'm quite fascinated by the idea of using a gig economy model for very hardcore R&D. So let's see what this company has been doing. This is their motto, by the way. Distributed in a previously unsearchable world are insights, flashes of genius and ideas that would never have been evident from job applications or resumes. Innocentive provides the network, methodology, platform, expert support for the innovative potential to be realized. So how does this work? It's an open innovation crowdsourcing company. The organizations put out their problems as challenges to the crowd. The crowd can either be external, that is worldwide, thousands of freelance problem solvers. Some companies want to be restricted. They have an internal crowd, certain employees, partners, customers, etc. It's a good award. The average amount is $20,000 if you solve a challenge. So this Innocentive has been running these challenges requiring heavy duty brain power. And most of the solvers are PhDs. It's a cheap process, but it costs much less than the normal R&D expenses for an industry. And the companies have access to millions of experts in many fields of science and tech. So the companies like the idea. And believe it or not, with this platform, the companies are able to find solutions to their biggest challenges within 45 to 90 days. Now, of course, it all depends on the high quality solutions from the crowd, right? You, if there are low quality solutions, this is not going to work. <clears throat> so I want to give you some idea of this model because I want CIIC uh, startups and others to think about this. So look on the leftmost corner, you see the question mark logo. So those are the seekers. They are the company people who have to post a problem or an idea. On the opposite end, diametrically opposite, you have the dollar sign, the solvers. They are participating in this gig economy and they want to be paid if they have the solution for the seeker. Now, in between, you see steps. That's where Innocentive comes in. They formulate the ideas into challenges. They'll help out with the intellectual property, IP issues. They'll make sure that the challenges are posted correctly. Everybody knows the rules, the details. And most important, they evaluate the answers provided by the solvers. So here is an example of a challenge. I just put it in the site. Look at this. They're giving one million US dollars to a solver who can solve this. Look at the tags. Look at the number of huge organizations that are paying for this. So what is this challenge? It is the SUDEP Institute challenge. SUDEP stands for Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy Patients. So what do they want? They want to have some kind of a blood test or urine test or maybe a nerve test to predict whether an epilepsy patient is suddenly going to die. Naturally, because this is a very chronic illness, lifelong there are people dealing with it. If there's a sudden death, you'd like to get a warning. Maybe you can change the treatment. So here is an example of a challenge from Innocentive. It's an open challenge and you can see 600 solvers have already logged on. For this. Here's another one. Again, almost million dollars, $850,000. Already a solution has been posed, so it's under evaluation. What is the challenge? I was quite surprised. Mixing viscous materials. You know, we never even think that these are problems. Coming from academics, we think of some nanotechnology or some very fancy uh, 
ideas in chemistry. But look at this. This is a very basic problem. Mixing highly viscous materials. Air Force. So many engineering companies. They have got together and they have posted this challenge. So I think these challenges are really powerful because they are coming from experienced industries who really know what's going on. And the last example, gamification to prevent spread of coronavirus, $1,000 reward, 95 active solvers, deadline is June. So here again, a whole bunch of organizations have got together to give this award to the solver who gets the right solution. So I hope this has opened your mind up to the kind of challenges that industry faces, right? Very interesting. Something that we researchers should open our eyes and take note of. Now you may ask, how do they not have to earn the money, right? What's in it for them? So they get fees at every step. A fee for posting the challenge, a subscription fee for the seekers, right? The company who wants to pose the challenge. Then they get a commission on the reward given to the successful solver. Now, does this work? Well, according to this 2009 report, the average client achieves a return on investment of 74% within three months. I think that's pretty good. And since 2005, Innocentive has run thousands of external and internal challenges and they've awarded more than 20 million dollars to the solvers so this is really looks like a win-win for both the industry as well as the crowd which is part of the gig economy which has a chance to solve some very important problems for the industry i was thinking about birac and i was thinking wow birac is also very similar in many ways. What's the difference? For those of you who may not know, BIRAC is our Department of Biotechnology India's special unit where they also pose challenges, call for proposals. They also give the solvers or the people who get the grant money uh, a certain amount of money if they promise to do certain work specified in the grant. So it may be an academic problem, maybe building a prototype, whatever. And this BIRAC model has been very useful and essential for the startups. I think we can all say that. But in addition to BIRAC, we should think of an innocentive model too, because that is for established industries. The industry poses the challenge. And then innocentive with its team of experts evaluates the solution and the solvers are only paid if they have the top-notch solution within 90 days. So I think we have enough brain power in India to consider something like the Innocentive. By the way, I didn't say, many people may have remembered an earlier slide where I said most of the solvers are PhDs. Well, guess where they come from? Most of them come from Russia, China, and India. So India already has a big presence on this innocentive uh, challenge model. So I think today's gig economy, we should have something like this, where we, in, we meaning the whole population of uh, science and technology, trained people should have a platform to solve the problems of established industries. I think it can work if it is transparent and fair. If the seekers and solvers have all the information, they have the rules, the details before the challenge is given online. And if things don't work, some sort of an exit strategy should be defined, agreeable to all the parties. And maybe this innocentive model can be applied to different domains. I don't know. But there's so much of uh, options here that we should think about. It may be hard for the industries to 
open up and talk about their challenges. But if they read about this innocent model, they may have a change of heart. So this is the challenge I pose for all of you today. I hope you think about it. Stay home and stay safe. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Hello? Yeah, ma'am, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful session. I will uh, now pause your screen share. And uh, before we move on with the questions, participants, I'll be launching a poll which will allow you to read the session. Uh, this is uh, uh, the possible feedback which you can give us so that we can uh, keep conducting uh, many more sessions like this. So you will... Uh, uh, participants will get a polling link on your screen. Please uh, poll. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Neil, so I'll pass it on to uh, Ms. Nisha uh, to start with the Q&A. She'll do the moderation of the questions and uh, pose the questions to you. Okay, ma'am? Thank you. Yeah, over to Nisha. Good evening, ma'am. Um, Hello, Nisha. Hi, ma'am. Um, shall we start the Q&A sessions, ma'am? You went through the questions. I'm not hearing you very well. Uh, Nisha, ma'am, your voice is not audible. Uh, Akshay, how is that now? A uh, little better, ma'am, but can be louder. Okay, okay. Ma'am, uh, shall we start the questions, ma'am? Please. Okay. Uh, ma'am, uh, most of the questions have led to the first, it's about plagiarism. So many of them have asked about repurposing means using the same data. Will it lead to plagiarism? So there was a couple of questions about that, ma'am. So you comment about plagiarism and repurposing means. Sure. I think that's a very good question. And plagiarism is a problem. So if you reuse somebody's data to analyze for your own reasons, you have to look at whether they have published a paper or a patent or an abstract in a conference and say that. Print that out in your paper that this analysis comes from this data done by Jones et al, year 2005. They have published this paper. I am taking the raw data and I am reanalyzing it for my purpose. That's perfectly okay. You have to just give them credit and cite their work. Nobody can fault you for plagiarism, but you have to acknowledge what you took from them whenever you publish your repurposed results. Am I clear? Okay, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, there's a question about free research database for social science, ma'am. Is that uh, for the social science students or uh, researchers? I'm sure there is, but because I come from a biotech science background, I didn't bother to search, but uh, it's a very good question. Please okay. search on your own. Otherwise, you know, we'll try to search and send you some link if we find it. Okay. But I think it will be there. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, is there any database for medical and paramedical? A few of the couple of uh, questions are from that side. Mm. <clears throat> Again, I didn't check, so I won't be able to answer. Uh, you all are much faster with internet searches than me, so please do that. You'll find a lot of databases. You have to make sure they are of high quality. So uh, I don't know because I didn't search. Okay, ma'am. Sure, sure. Uh, ma'am, there's another question. Is like, are there any good courses available for meta-analysis? 
I think Coursera has a good beginner statistics course. But nowadays, uh, I think NPTEL from IIT Madras and all the IITs, they also offer statistics courses. But if you don't like the formal courses, maybe you can even look at informal sources. Frankly, I myself don't know meta-analysis, so I don't know what to recommend. But Coursera and NPTEL definitely are worth considering. They have very good basic statistics courses. Okay. Um, here's another researcher, Hemendra Singh from uh, uh, Jammu. So he's asking, it's like he has developed a diagnostic kit for COVID-19 and they were able, successfully able to develop it by principle. And uh, they have even filed provisional. So now what he wants mm. is, I want his suggestion how to proceed for validation with low budget and good result. Mm. COVID-19, nothing is uh, low budget. And unfortunately, all the validation, I think, is controlled by ICMR. ICMR has one big center, the National Institute of Virology, Pune. They do the validation for all such kits which come in. So I'm very happy this researcher has made this effort. But ICMR is quite slow. You will have to go through their bureaucracy to get it validated. Okay, ma'am. Uh, Miss Monica, she has asked, um, she is a biologist and she's asking what are the mathematical method and programming languages are there for biologists? Wow. I, uh, I wish I knew more about this. Some of my uh, colleagues in MGR University, they are all learning art programming which I'm told is very important language for statistical analysis, but I really don't know. I'm more of a lab-based uh, biologist, and I'm only using a few simple softwares for analyzing the microarray work. So I'm not really the right person to answer about the mathematics part of it. Okay, ma'am. Uh, Sundar Murthy, Murthy has asked, what are the challenges of getting a patent and how to publish a good research? Hello? Uh, yes, ma'am. Able to hear me, ma'am? Uh, please repeat the last question. Uh, the, there are two parts, ma'am. The first part is challenge of getting a patent. And second is how to publish a good research article. Uh, patents I don't know much about. The one patent uh, I have is part of a team and the team leader actually worked with CSIR to get the patent uh, accepted and registered. Uh, so I don't have much knowledge on that. But publishing a good paper, yes. I think you have to get a good idea whether you take a existing data and reanalyze whatever you do. You have to get good statistically significant data. And nowadays there are a lot of journals which publish. You have to be careful to choose the peer reviewed journals. Unfortunately, many of them charge quite a bit of money for publishing your paper. But there are some journals which give a discount so you can publish it at a lower rate. And there are also certain sites where you can just put your paper out. Uh, they are very well regarded, but they are not considered peer reviewed. Peer reviewed means that your paper is sent to a journal, then that journal's editor asks three or four experts to review the paper. That is called peer review. And then based on their comments, your paper is accepted or rejected. So usually we go for peer review. But uh, this is a good question and it is possible to do, but it's getting harder to find good quality journals that don't charge too much. Okay, ma'am. Uh, okay. Next is a PhD scholar. So she, her anxiety is mentioned over here. 
So what she is saying, how do you confirm a research is novel? Is it only through literature survey? Even if it's literature survey, how do you make it sure that you didn't miss out anything? And how do you endorse your work that it is novel also? Hmm. Uh, I think you really only have to do the literature and patent search. And there are different sites for different types of patents international patient, uh, patent, Indian patent, etc. So yes, you have to be very thorough in your search. But besides searching, that's all you can do. The other thing is, if you are repurposing somebody else's data, uh, make sure that they themselves have not patented it. If they have patented it, note down that patent number and contact them and see if you can reuse that data for your own purpose. Okay, ma'am. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Elizabeth from Ramachandra University. So she has directly asked, uh, Biorec appreciates solutions within three months time. It may be applicable mm. inventing a device or a low cost dental fixtures, etc. But when it comes to research, a 90 day timeline is very less. Can you please advise on how to go about on this? Uh, I don't think I meant to say that the research should be done in 90 days, but I'm telling you what Innocentive does and it works because they have the crowd, they have so many people solving at any given time that within three months they are able to get very high quality solutions from PhDs. So I think uh, my answer would be that maybe we researchers sitting in universities have to speed up. We have to find a different model for working. And unfortunately, researchers don't collaborate and work together. I think this is one of the reasons why things are slow in academic research, whereas BIRAC is able to get faster results. So let's uh, give credit to BIRAC and say that research, I think, needs to be more collaborative, more transparent. And that will speed up the answers. Maybe not to 90 days, but maybe six months to solve some problem. And again, that uh, vice chancellor from Kerala University is perfectly right. A lot of research in Indian universities is copycat research. I'm very sorry to say this, but it's true. Okay, ma'am. Uh, the same related to the copycat research, uh, Mr. Mohan has asked, gene expression studies were performed throughout the world. So in that case, will this be considered as a copycat research? Well, if you do exactly what the original study did, so I gave you my example very clearly. There was a data set looking at normal skin versus melanoma skin, and they looked for diagnostic markers, markers related to response to drugs, etc. We took that data set, the raw data, and we asked a completely different question about fat metabolism in the skin. So if you take the same raw data and completely analyze for a different purpose, that is not at all copycat. In fact, that's quite novel and it is appreciated and it's publishable. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, Mr. Varun uh, needs to know about incentive, uh, innocentive challenges. So what is the range of challenges and, and the capabilities? Very glad somebody asked about that. I think <laughs> it's best to go to their website because there's literally thousands of challenges and very uh, intellectually stimulating to read all that. I don't know Mr. Varun's uh, topic, but he himself would know he looks at the innocentive site. No, okay, ma'am. Uh, again, coming to uh, gig economy, ma'am. Uh, this is a professor, mm. Dr. Jansi. She's asking, can we be a part of R&D platforms participating in gig economy as free freelancers? I wish, I wish we could do that. You know, I don't know the answer, Dr. Jansi. Uh, I have only seen this innocentive and I got quite excited about it. 
uh, I don't have the brain power, frankly, to solve some of these innocentive uh, challenges. Uh, but they are there. There are challenges on stem cells, challenges on um, very uncurable rare diseases. So take your pick, you know, they're really out there. And uh, look at the Innocentive website for the life sciences. Even if you don't solve their challenges, it will give you some ideas for what the industry is looking for. So it's definitely worth looking at. Yeah. But right now, as far as I know, there is no gig economy platform for R&D for Indians, as far as I know. Okay. I'm hoping somebody there will start one in the audience. <laughs> okay, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Shanmukha Priya has uh, raised a concern. She is like, ma'am, I have a doubt on herbals. Like in India, hmm. people are very much so much attached to Ayurveda. But then apart from hmm. Indian, Indians, most of them are allergic to herbals. <laughs> hmm. I didn't know people were allergic, but yeah. You know, there are people allergic to allopathic, homeopathic medicines also, right? There are people allergic to dust. So allergy is going to be there always. Uh, I don't think you can say allergy only to Ayurvedic medicines. And I think in the Western world, five or six Ayurvedic herbs are very popular. Ashwagandha is one of them. Turmeric. So many others are coming up. Uh, have you heard uh, ginger is coming up? So I think once the science starts validating the benefits of these Ayurvedic medicines, uh, they are gaining acceptance worldwide. Of course, some allergy issues may be there, but uh, I think for the most part, they are working for people. If you buy the right quality drugs, so you have to know the source of the Ayurvedic product. You have to be very careful. In Chennai, we know that MCOPS is a very good uh, place where they actually grow their own herbs and prepare their medicines. Uh, Himalaya Drug Company is another one which has very careful quality control. So if you get the right source of the Ayurvedic medicine, I think it works quite well and allergy is not an issue. If you already know you're allergic to something, then you should talk to a doctor before you consider taking anything, allopathy, homeopathy, Ayurveda. So I hope I've helped you answer that question. Okay. Uh, Ms. Rubina wants to know your idea on free research guidance on mathematical modeling in cancer. Uh, like I said, I'm a very poor mathematician. I only use some simple software for microarray array analysis. Uh, I don't know of any free modeling uh, programs, but there are certainly uh, programs for molecular docking, for microarray analysis, some of the NGS data. Also, there are some free parts. So you really have to search and look and uh, start learning whatever is free and equip yourself with those techniques. Sometimes you have to make your problem suit the technique that you have learned, you know. So I'm only able to do microarray work. I keep on using that same technique because I don't know any other mathematical technique. But even within microarray data sets, there are so much variety to choose from. So I don't think I've answered your question very well. But that's all I can say. Okay, ma'am. Uh, another scholar, what she has mentioned, if a work is published abroad already, can she use the way of work with some new methodologies? Will that be plagiarism? So you want to take some data that you've already published and do some other work. Work, exactly. No. Add, add, add to it and then republish it, right? Yeah. Yes, ma'am, yeah. that's what you mean. I think that's perfectly allowed. You have to say that this work was done 
at such and such lab. And then it was published in Journal X in this year under this grant. And now we're going to use that to add more uh, research knowledge and get a new paper. Yes. Provided you give the credit to all the people who helped you in that US work, I think it's fine. Oops, I lost the screen for a little bit. Are you able to hear? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes. Anything else? Are we done? Uh, ma'am, a couple of questions more. I'll make it fast, ma'am. There's a question from a medical no, student. Okay, ma'am. There's a question from medical UG students. So their question is, uh, can they pursue research while focusing their studies? Yeah, I think uh, if you do some online bioinformatics, from my point of view, bioinformatics, from your point of view, whether you're in computer science or engineering or whatever, look for this free data. I gave you some examples like NASA or WHO or whatever you want. Social sciences, I don't know, but there will be free data. Free data. Learn what programs are used to tackle that raw data, reanalyze it with your own ideas. And yes, while you're studying or working or whatever, definitely, it's a great idea for you to do this part-time. I, I really think that's wonderful if you do that. Okay, you have to work very hard because you have your regular job or studies and you have to do this on the side. But it's doable, yes. Uh, next is from Mr. Mohan. So what he's asking is like publishing in free journals without any processing charges. Are they good or bad in your uh, review? Man? Yeah, this is a big problem. A lot of the good journals want uh, even close to $1,000, $2,000 publication fee. Uh, many times the institute will give you a small part of it. And sometimes you have to pay the rest yourself. It is difficult. Uh, there are now, as I said, some sites which have become quite popular and quite good quality. So I can send Nisha the site. It's called BioRXIV. And some of the latest COVID research is being published there because uh, it's such a hot topic. Uh, scientists want to put out that data. If they send it to a journal, you know, they'll take two to three months at least to review it. So I think there are these sites which are accepting the papers without charge, but without peer review also. So if you just put it there and online itself, there will be some people who give comments and likes or whatever and review the paper. I don't know how it works. I also want to try it. But Mohan has correctly pointed out that it is becoming very expensive to publish in the traditional journals, peer-reviewed journals, where they take two to three months to give you a decision. Okay, ma'am. I'll send you this BioRxiv site. Sure, ma'am. We'll see. Nisha. Uh, ma'am, next is Ms. Asha. She wants to know the role of uh, material chemist in bat uh, in uh, for the research of COVID-19, ma'am. What can material science, chemist, Amit, material chemist can do for the researches related to COVID-19? I don't know much about this, but I did see that one of the IITs, or maybe IISC Bangalore, recently in the newspaper announced that they have developed some coating for the protective masks and gear. Maybe it gives the special chemical coating gives some extra protection. I don't know. But then, you know, there are also all these allergies like the other person talked about. So, yeah, I think for a chemist, there can be some novel ideas in the type of uh, coatings for masks or ventilator tubes, things like that. But it's not my subject. I don't know that much about it. Okay, ma'am. Uh, there's a question from a nutrition student. So what she is asking is like how to do better research 
especially where she is focusing on public health and particularly a group of people so whether mm. doing such research is it valid or will it become a plagiarism because it since it's group of people are uh, coming into the research ah uh, i think if you have lots of people working on one problem is that what she means yes ma'am uh her fo- she is focusing into public health and a group of people no but where does the plagiarism issue arise i don't understand no she is asking it uh, whether will there any issues oh. will be the related plagiarism because group no, of people i don't understand the question because uh, is she working with say 30 40 people on uh, malaria and its public health or she is looking at a population of 30 to 40 people with malaria what does she mean it's uh, the question is quite up broad okay ma'am okay ma'am so uh, in related to this ma'am if uh, when you are doing statistics for group of people you will be taking data from other uh, uh, other studies other ethnicities other countries so when you take that yes. and bring it to your studies how do you take it ma'am how do you what's your review over that i think one would have to look at this meta analysis techniques and work according to those rules and i don't know meta analysis myself but i think for somebody looking at public health or big data like that you have to learn it there's no shortcut okay ma'am uh, ma'am dr srinivasan from uh, ramachandra he has asked us to please specify three simple three criteria uh, uh sorry ma'am uh, specify simple three criteria to complete low budget proposal i think i've already said that in my slide yes ma'am. slide very first slide repurposing data repurposing existing tech and repurposing your brain so beyond that i don't know what else i can add okay ma'am uh uh the from ms chitra has asked beta blockers shall we include in the category of repurposing ma'am i don't know enough about that but uh, there are many drugs that are repurposed for different diseases i don't know specifically about beta blockers i'd have to read okay ma'am and uh, there's another question uh, it's again about the copycat research they're asking uh, doing research on assessment of nutritional status is common heading but while choosing this with different sample will this be considered as a com- uh, copycat research okay so the question is you keep doing one questionnaire or some protocol and you keep changing the nutrients right exactly ma'am exactly you keep repeating yes. you yes, keep ma'am. repeating yes ma'am. the same technique um uh, yes, tough to say because uh, nutrition there's so many different compounds and then are they pure are they mixed what form they are they may have different benefits and sometimes there is only one or two tests that you can do to measure the nutritional power right so i don't think you can call that copycat it okay. really depends on the actual work so if they actually okay. show it to me then i can say whether it's copycat but in principle it sounds fine to me okay ma'am ma'am uh, miss seena has asked a question similar to your studies she said she has asked us like would you support studies on crude extract of plant or pure compound studies for their bioactivities excellent question in fact uh, we struggled with this in pune and uh, my professor and i we all thought we should stick to crude extracts because the traditional ayurveda utilizes the whole root or the stem or the fruit and most of it is water extracts so we shouldn't go for all these hexane and ethanol extracts so we did do hot water extracts uh, unfortunately not much dissolves when you do that type of extract but we were able to see bioactivity with the hot water extracts 
We compared hot water extracts with 50% water, 50% ethanol extracts, and there was quite a lot of similarity. Our project was on anti-arthritic activity. So we got quite similar results with hot water extract and ethanol water extracts. But the short answer is, I believe crude extract is very important. Okay, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, coming back to the same journal question itself, uh, Ms. Abirami has asked uh, uh, about uh, articles in open access and private access. So how is it both are equally benefited or is there a weightage when it comes to open and private, ma'am? Uh, benefit to whom? Uh, so to the researcher. For the, uh, for the reader in the public, obviously the open access is beneficial. But unfortunately, open access means the author, that is you, who are publishing, you have to pay the journal. So you are out of pocket. But uh, the advantage of open access is I've noticed that once your PDF is in an open access format, more people download it and your citations do go up. So if you can afford to pay that amount for open access, it's worth it. Uh, it's uh, coming to meta-analysis, Mr. Parthasarathy has raised a question, how to do a meta-analysis when analyzing data from different parts of the world, for example, 197 yeah. countries, or any tools can be or... yes. okay. I clearly said that I don't know statistics well enough, and I don't know meta-analysis, so I can't really answer the question. But my job today was to suggest strategies for people to improve their research. It doesn't mean that I am an expert on all these strategies. I would love to be an expert on statistics and meta-analysis, but I'm not, so I can't answer that question. Okay, ma'am. Uh, again, Saundarya Rajan, she's asked is like, uh, is it, uh, uh, my question, do you think that it is the right time to accelerate more translational studies in India? I think all over the world, translational studies are going on all the time. It's a very broad term. Yes, it's going on for all kinds of uh, diseases. Translational meaning bench to bedside. So you exactly. find something on the lab bench and you're able to take it as a product to the uh, clinic. This is exactly what Bayrak is trying to encourage, right? Medical devices, uh, new ways of uh, treating people. So yes, I think translational medicine has been going on for a long time. Okay, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Chitra has asked a question, Amit. Uh, what your review on artificial intelligence and how is it going to play the major role in research, ma'am? I don't know much about that. I'm very honest when it comes to these things. Uh, what little experience I have with big data comes from microarray analysis, and I could see its power. So I definitely think if you have a statistics background, it will help you jump into the AI world. And please do it if you can. If you have that brain power and that mathematical talent, please go for it. Okay, ma'am. And we're coming to the last question. So it's raised by Dr. Deepa. She wants to know, uh, do we need any prior permission when we plan a research on repurposing of already patented drug? Hmm. I would think you would have to look at the details of the patent, whether they want some licensing fee or some other way of getting acknowledged. But it's better to check with some IP expert on this before you proceed because some copyright issues, uh, violations may come up. So again, I'm not the legal expert, but to be safe, please do check with your uh, institute's IP cell. Nowadays, a lot of such IP advice is available. IIT Madras also gives uh, free IP advice. So ask the professionals. <clears throat> Okay, ma'am. So once again, I want to thank you so much. 
you were able to cover uh, it support the academics the startups you were you were able to cover even the uh, uh, you know innocent that was a good good opportunity for everyone also ma'am so i thank i you. hope so yes ma'am uh, is uh, akshay are you online yes madam i'm there yeah. thank you ma'am yeah over to you thank you very much thank you so much shall i uh, yes can i leave the webinar Yes, ma'am. Yes, so there's a quick, short, uh, no, uh, information to the participants. So most of you have been asking for the uh, presentation. Uh, we'll be hosting the video of this session on our YouTube channel. Uh, in the following mails, we'll be receiving a link for our YouTube channel, uh, wherein you can subscribe and uh, watch to the session. So I will look forward to having you on YouTube as well. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm ending the webinar now. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you participants I'm ending the webinar now